It's the winter of 2021 and I'm sat in a cafe looking around at my competition. There's a guy over there on his phone. There's another guy over there shallow breathing. And there's another guy over there reading a newspaper. What are you going to learn from a newspaper? You're not going to learn how to be a better person. You're not going to learn how to meditate or to take cold showers. I'm reading a self-improvement book. I'm becoming a high level intelligent man of value. And so I'm reading this book and I've read the first sentence and the second sentence and the third sentence. And I've forgot the first sentence already. I start reading the first sentence again, trying to remember it this time, but I'm not in the cafe anymore. It's three years ago and I'm sat at my computer desk playing League of Legends, but my asshole friend Andrew has just removed me from our Skype call which means that I have to play this entire game by myself whilst all my other four friends have been able to communicate in the call, laughing and joking. And I'm here sat in silence. But I shouldn't be thinking about that because I'm here trying to read this book, but my mind keeps going to all these other useless places. I feel kind of stupid and upset. I can't even read. I mean, I can read, but I can't even remember what I've just read. I remember the times when I used to be able to read an entire book and actually remember what I had read. Come on, let's focus, let's focus, let's focus. First, I need some more coffee. Now I'm at the counter deciding if I should get a coffee or a hot chocolate. A hot chocolate would taste nicer, but it's got more sugar. Sugar's not really good for me. The caffeine in the coffee might actually help, but then it wouldn't taste as nice as the, the thing, as the hot chocolate. And then, um, and my alarm goes off. I need to go home now. I've been here trying to read the same page over the last hour. And as I'm leaving the cafe, I feel so disappointed at myself because I'm looking around at the same people I was judging before. The guy who's on his phone is still on a call with someone that he loves and he's laughing. The shallow breather is there smiling as he eats a donut and the guy reading the newspaper is more focused than I'll ever be. I realized that it wasn't just about showing up. That's what everyone online was telling me was show up, show up, show up. Well, I showed up. I did the hard work. But it's not just about showing up physically, it's about showing up mentally. And that if I can't focus or get into a flow state, I'm the least productive person here. My name is Hamza and I've put together this full step-by-step -step guide to flow states, which will help you to master focus in relationships, work, your career, studies, reading, everything you wanna do requires focus. You know how much everyone online is talking about the, the value of your attention and time. This is the one guide you need to learn how to focus because in researching for this video, I've read over 10 hours and also watched a bunch of Andrew Huberman podcasts to distill it all into just this one guide. And this is an actionable guide. This isn't just something that you watch mindlessly to aid your content consumption addiction. This is something you're going to be taking action on so that it actually changes your life. Deal? Your first actionable step is to implement something very quickly, which is going to increase your focus whilst you learn from this. And the easiest strategy to do this is to simply just make this video full screen. You don't need to go and scroll to the comments and look at the suggested videos or see the views or anything like that. Make this video completely full screen right here, right now. And one final point, stare directly into my eyes as I talk to you. Make sure you're not constantly looking around, bored, looking out the window, checking your phone. Look at me as if we were having a present focused conversation. <laughs> Step one, what is a flow state? You've probably heard of athletes talk about being in the zone. You hear them say things like, oh, I got into the zone and that's when I started to score all the points. You got to get your mind in the zone. Athletes have known this for a very long time. Being in the zone means getting into a flow state. And this means it's like a specific period of time where your brain just has no irrelevant thought and you merge into the task that you're doing. This means that whilst you do a certain task, you're not thinking about memories from some, like, you know, from high school. You're not thinking about irrelevant thoughts and a to-do list of what you're going to do after this. You're literally so immersed into the activity that you almost merge into it yourself. And as we discover in this guide, which this is going to make you feel really enlightened, this is the peak human experience. When you learn how to consistently get into a flow state, you're going to realize that this was the secret to happiness all along. A flow state lasts anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. 
I hope that you're not one of the people whose flow states is like very short because you just can't get that much done. But there's a bunch of things that I'm going to teach you to prolong how long you can get into the flow state for inside of this guide. This is very similar to the concept of deep work by the author Cal Newport. Deep work is more like the habits around your work. You don't get distracted. You don't switch tasks. Flow state is the specific block where you literally have no thought and we're narrowing in on this one specific task. So it's, it's kind of like the next level of deep work. It's that one Point one, the benefits of flow states. How many people do you speak to who aren't even present when you speak to them? How many times have you spoke to your mother and you can see that her brain's just mind wandering with your friends and they've got their phones in their hand and you know you see their eyesight gloss down when they start typing away while she talks to them? It's like most people are honestly like socially disabled these days. Like they genuinely, like, honestly, it feels like most people have got special needs when you speak to them. It really does, right? Like their, their brain, especially young people, their brain just like goes, like they, they start twitching and doing like some TikTok dance out of nowhere. It's just strange when you speak to someone because they're not in a flow state because their mind's wandering. And honestly, you're probably one of these people. We look outward and we see the problem of the modern times with young people being, you know, like ADHD symptoms, everyone's attention spans so bad. We're looking outward when we are part of that group. And so when your mother's telling you a story of like her childhood, she actually feels like you're listening to her. And when your friend is opening up to you and you're actually in a flow state listening to him and you're not thinking of something irrelevant, you're not waiting to jump in with something you're saying, and he's able to express, you know, that he's going through a hard time. You being in a flow state might have just saved his life. And when you do meet the nice, beautiful, feminine woman that you want to partner up with, she's going to feel this at your most intimate moments. And this will make your love blossom with her. The major benefit of flow states is happiness. It's seen as the peak human experience by psychologists because this is a moment when our mind just stops talking. There was a very famous study which was titled A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. If you've ever researched like meditation, mindfulness, presence online, you've probably heard of this. This was a massive study where they got people to um, kind of like hold pages. Imagine kind of like a phone that will beep it and send a notification. And they got hundreds of people to hold these phones through their normal life and they would just send out beeps like notifications and ask him, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you thinking about? And how happy are you? And they found that very consistently, if your mind was not focused on the thing that it was currently doing, you were unhappy. So for example, the worst period of like a normal life for people is when they're commuting, especially when they're stuck in traffic, because no one is stuck in traffic presently. No one's like, you know, they're like super mindful in a flow state. Everyone's thinking about something else. Everyone can't wait till get, you know, they get home. And the same is said for even in working and studying and the peak experience for most people is actually making love because that's the moment when most people are present. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Flow state is when it feels like you have no mind at all. So it's the, the as good of an, like a human experience as you could possibly get. Step 1.2, why no one's happy these days. I want you to imagine hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago, how simple life would have been. You're a fisherman. You wake up next to your wife and you see the most beautiful sunrise. You go out into the boat or maybe to the dock and you fish there in a flow state. Every now and then your mind wanders, but to something kind of pleasant, you're thinking about life and some deep like philosophical thing that means a lot to you, maybe religion and God. And you catch a bunch of fish, which means that you and your family will eat today. You go back home, you hand the fish over to your beautiful feminine wife. She cooks it, you all eat it, flow, love, presence, amazing. Now I want you to imagine yourself as the same fisherman, but now going through the industrial revolution. The factories have been built, there's pollution everywhere. The fish aren't here anymore. You try and you try and you try, it's been two days, you haven't brought back any fish, you need to beg now. You need to beg to be able to feed your family. The skill that you've been leveling up doesn't work anymore. And your family are hungry. There's work in the factory. And so you go, you split up the family. You go far away into the cities where the factories are. 
and you're going to go work hard so that you can send money back to your family. You go there into these grey, dark, soulless buildings before regulations of work and health standards were made, before the 40-hour week was a thing and you were expected to literally work more like 14 to 16 hours a day. You work, you work, you work, you work next to people that you don't like, for a boss that you don't like, for a company that means nothing to you, so that you can go home and use the money that you've made to buy a fish. Obviously, this is an exaggeration of the transition here, but there's a lot of people in the world whose experience of work is exactly like this poor fisherman's. When you look around at most people in the modern day, it feels like we should have been that fisherman, but who is now placed into work that he dislikes. So it doesn't feel like a surprise when you realize that most people are actually quite unhappy with their lives. And to understand why that's the case, when you think about how crazy that is, most people are actually unhappy. Why? Because we don't acknowledge how the mind works. When you wake up and you go to the bathroom first thing in the morning and you brush your teeth, that was only five minutes long. But you got 100 negative, upsetting thoughts, didn't you? You go and eat something, but you're not really focused on the food. You're thinking about high school. You're thinking about that person. You're thinking about your boss. You're thinking about the fact that you hate your life, that you reset your nofap streak, that you're lonely, that you don't have a girlfriend. That, you know, that girl that you were messaging has not replied and now you're feeling anxious about it. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And most of us spend all of our time with a mind that's thinking about high school, remembering memories, and just all around, just regurgitating negative, hateful, horrible thoughts. What's the cure to this? Focusing. Working. You know, online, you've probably seen this, there's so many people who are anti-work these days. People, you know, really seem to hate the idea of their jobs and work. And you know what's interesting? Still, people in work are always the happiest. You know, when their study's done, the same kind of modern day study where they send a notification to their phone to see how happy they are and what they're currently doing. Still to this day, people are in more flow states in work than they are in their leisure time. So, you know, in your free time, all of us want more free time, right? In our free time is when we are actually the most depressed because our mind has nothing to focus on. There's an entrepreneur that I really like that I've learned a lot from. His name's Alex Becker. And when I was learning from him in my early days of business, he kept on saying the same thing where he said, like, the material success won't make you happy. The happiest you'll ever be is when you can get to, like, work hard on a project that means a lot to you. And it sounded like this sort of woo-woo BS, but I'm beginning to understand it a lot more. If your mind is not focused on a task that means a lot to you, you will experience symptoms of depression. This includes in the free time that we all value so much. We would love to take an extra day off work for the people who work in a job they don't like. They'd love to have more time off work. They're actually less happy in that time off because no matter what, your mind needs something to do. The father who works super hard, but then he comes home and he sits on the couch and he literally just drinks alcohol and he watches TV all day. That's the worst part of his day, even though that's the part of his day that he desires the most. Our perception of work and of free time is totally destroyed. We, we probably shouldn't have that much free time. We should have the ability to manage our time, but we should not be sat here doing nothing because that's when our brain just goes to these irrelevant negative thoughts. Instead, you want to know like the best way to live? We should have more work. We should have more opportunities to get into this deep workflow. Now you might feel upset and angry at that. And, and I can imagine a lot of people who work like normal jobs hating me for saying this. But the truth is, this is the time when you're genuinely going to be the happiest, even though you think it's going to be at home when you're scrolling on your phone. We need to destroy this anti-work culture. Understand that, yeah, a lot of jobs are absolutely trash and we should try to get out of them. But we should understand that work and doing things and putting your mind to focus is fantastic. Sitting around wanting idle time, leisure time, free time and not doing anything. You know, a lot of young entrepreneurs desire is like to try and make a lot of money so that they can go sit in a beach in Thailand and just kind of like sit there for a while and go, whew, now this is the life with a pina colada, bro, I've done it. I've done it. It's less fun than just being at home and just working on something that means a lot to you. 
Your life is only built up of the experience that your mind perceives. And so if the experience is boring, your mind's automatically going to start just wandering and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. No matter if you're sat in the beach in Thailand or the cafe, I've done it all and I'm telling you from that side. But when your mind is focused on a task, here you are sat at your computer and you can really get into a flow state there for hours a day. You can't help but not be like super happy and focused and there's no little demons in your mind. That's what we should strive for. But the problem comes because we're so externally focused. We've been sold this idea that materialism will be the cure to all of our pains and unhappiness from the moment we were born, especially if you've lived in Western countries, even though this is also very prevalent in like India, Pakistan, and the Eastern countries as well now. Most of us believe that this unhappiness and boredom feeling that we feel every day will be cured if we achieve some kind of external material success. If we, for example, get to 10,000 subscribers, if we make this much money in our business, if we get this many followers, if we buy the car, the house, the watch, all these things, now more and more people People are beginning to wake up and realize that these things won't make you happy because our desire for the material success changes what we do for like the flow state activity today. Let's say, for example, your natural 10 out of 10 flow state activity that would literally bring like the most joy and happiness to your life is teaching. But that doesn't bring much material success, right? Teaching doesn't pay that much, right? And so you start to chase the material success. And so to get the money, all the fancy stuff that you want, you change the daily task that you're doing. And then before you know it, you're spending your time doing some business that you hate, or, you know, like working some high level career. You wanted to become a teacher, but your parents convinced you to get into engineering or into finance or something. And here you are spending all of your actual time, the most valuable thing there is, just because external validation might come, there's status, there's the prestige, there's the extra money. But then those things don't change your life. They don't improve your life. And mental health research proves this. There's a free online course that changed my life forever. It's called The Science of Wellbeing. If you just search it on Google, you can go and find it. It's a very good online course made by Yale University. And they break down like the real studies to show what actually makes someone happy. And it, it is not what you have dedicated your life to. You're gonna start coping and disagreeing with this. Good grades don't make you happy. A high paying job doesn't make you happy. Even the body, like the body transformation doesn't even make you happy. The watch, the fancy car, the eat, like any of these things don't actually improve your mental well being. You might think that they do because in the research that I've seen, what's very interesting is that we genuinely perceive a happiness boost when we decide to like go and, you know, increase our grades or to buy the thing. We think it's going to make us happy. But when we actually get the good grades, when we actually buy the car, our happiness does not change at all. Usually there's a little bit of a dip, actually. The things that make you happy, you want to know what they are? It's the softer things that sound so uncool. It's mindfulness, it's good sleep, good diets, it's social connection, kindness, and flow states. Don't focus on the material success that the modern world is trying to convince you is important of getting more likes on Instagram because you can go and find someone who's achieved everything that you want and they'll literally look to you like normal. Like how badly do you want 2 million subscribers? I've got it. It changes nothing in your life. If my day was filled up of tasks that I didn't like because I had this many subscribers, I would genuinely have a worse life now than two years ago when I had none. Every millionaire, every guy who's made money, who's actually made money and not lying about it, will tell you the same thing. It's like you wake up and life's just exactly the same. It Nothing has changed, but just what you spend your time doing. And yet we keep chasing the material desires. You're not gonna just stop wanting to get higher grades just because I've said this to you, right? And so this is, in a weird way, this is like an average person's level of ambition. I want to get the material success. You know what's very interesting? The biggest, especially male influencers of today, they're all right here. You see these guys who, who are showing this material success, the external results, and that's what they live their lives for. Here they are just running on the hamster wheel inside of the matrix that they so fight against. Here they are controlled by the puppet masters that they speak so ill of. If there is a man who's chained to his, his incessant need for external validation for this materialism, he's not free. 
In fact, I think a man's maturity comes at the moment when he realizes it's not about the things that are outside of you, it's purely internal. But here we are with this level of ambition, hoping to get like a head turn when someone sees us in the car or the fancy watch. What we're suggesting here will lead you to a better life. It will lead you to discovering your purpose. It will lead you to experiencing and understanding spirituality. But you won't get as much of the real world results because the guy who's totally obsessed with the material success, let's, let's say making money, he will make more money than you if you're not obsessed with that and you're rather thinking about flow states. He will. So this is gonna hurt our egos. This is gonna start to trigger us because if we wanna be true to ourselves and you know just chase the flow state activity and let's say it's teaching compared to the, you know, the guy who's doing the high level business even though he hates his life, he's gonna get more likes on Instagram. We're gonna feel like this level of pressure that we could probably do that. He's making more money than us. You know, we should compete with him. And before you know it, here you are pursuing something that means nothing to you with tasks that you actually dislike in your day. Why? Because the external success, the numbers in your bank account might be nice. Voluntarily giving yourself mild forms of depression, not even enjoying the success once you make it. Now, let me give you a disclaimer. This doesn't mean that we should okay, just sit here and do nothing with our lives and not work hard. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't set goals or you know have something to like look forward to, to work towards. What I'm specifically saying is we align the goals and even some of the material success is absolutely fine, but we align that to the flow state tasks that we actually like because th like this is the, the level of ambition for most people, including even rich guys. This is the level of ambition that we've got. It'd be nice to make great amounts of money, but not at the sacrifice for our experience of life, right? So this is where everyone else is. They, they just want to get the money. They just want to get the subscribers, right? We want to get that stuff whilst actually enjoying the day-to-day -day life because the depressed millionaire, what, is he really successful? If the guy, you know, you hear the athletes who say, oh, I hated every minute of training, but I still, you know, I did it anyway and I've got the title belt. Are they even that successful? If they genuinely didn't even like find their experience of life pleasant, if they wouldn't go back and do it again, Mike Tyson's there, like you can go search on YouTube. This is an actionable step, let's do this. Go search on YouTube, Mike Tyson belts garbage. It's a quick little clip of him with some like news reporter or interviewer and, he, and he's showing the, the belts and he's like, oh yeah, they're all garbage, they're all garbage. When I was a kid, I you know, this meant a lot to me. It's all garbage, it means nothing and he throws it on the floor. Because the external success isn't gonna do anything. The, the belt, so imagine sacrificing your fucking brain cells, your health and your time and your life to get this belt that other people think is cool, but if it doesn't change anything for you because in the end, all you have is the flow experience of life. So here is your actionable step for this part of the video. Go look at your goals. Either write them down if you haven't already, or if you've got them written down somewhere, just bring them up on screen and just kind of look at them for a few seconds. Pause this video and just look at them, remind yourself of what they are. If you don't have clear goals written down, then just kind of think about what they would be based on your recent actions. So, you know, you're really dedicated in school, so your goal kind of is to like graduate. You're really dedicated in fitness, so your goal is to get more muscular, for example. Just think about what your goals are for a few seconds, pause this video, and then just play it again after like 10 seconds, right? Now, I'm just gonna call you out here. I'm guessing that pretty much all of your goals are all external success, right? They're all material success. They're all like the real world things that other people can see. It's what grades you've gotten, how much money you're making, how many subscribers you've got, what your physique looks like. This is pretty much our goals, right? And it isn't necessarily a problem to have goals like that, but this is where it gets interesting. When we have goals, it can be a problem if the daily tasks that we do don't put us into a flow state to achieve that goal. So we have the goal, for example, to get to $10,000 a month in business, right? That's a pretty good goal to get. It'll change your life. That sounds awesome. But to achieve that goal, if we have to spend a bunch of our time doing tasks that don't put us into a flow state, that don't even align to our core personality and values and virtues, but we're doing it just for the 10K a month, we are literally sacrificing our lives for material success that we know isn't going to change much. What we want is we still want the material success. I'm not telling you to you know to abandon that, but rather we want to make sure that we get these material goals with the tasks in the day-to-day -day that put us into a flow state. So getting to 10K a month in business 
is an awesome goal, but if you're doing it with this task of like, for example, you're doing this business model that you don't even know what you're doing, you're doing drop shipping, for example, and you hate being a drop shipper, it's kind of embarrassing. It's this, you know, business where you're just kind of like selling Chinese products with a massive delivery time and it's just a shitty product, but you're making some money from it, but you don't even like it. Even that, let's say right here, right now, that your life and your family's life could be changed if you were making two grand a month. The thing is, you would probably get to two grand a month faster if you were doing a business which its tasks would put you into a flow state so you were good at it, you were focused at it, rather than just choosing the business that you've heard some influencer talk about online, maybe including me. So your actionable step is to look at your goals. Write down the major task that you currently do to achieve that goal. So for example, one of your goals is to build like an aesthetic body, 10% body fat, right? And one of the major tasks that you do is the gym session and specifically it's like a weightlifting session just ask yourself is that a genuine flow state activity or not and be honest because i think i would have coped a bit a few years ago and be like yeah, yeah it is genuinely ask yourself do you get zero thought are you in the zone for that task for business, you know, the goal is $10,000 a month. The main task is, for example, sending out DMs to people to like get them to hopefully buy your stuff in your like agency marketing or whatever like a business you do. Is that a genuine flow state activity? Like, nah, my brain's always wandering. I'm always bored, right? You know, I just get it done anyway. Don't abandon the goal, but it might be, it might save your life. If you just figure out maybe there's a different kind of task that you could do to achieve the same goal. So you still want to get jacked, but there's a different kind of workout. Maybe you'd enjoy like the CrossFit style workouts where you're training with 10 people and they're shouting at you whilst you do like, you know, the pull-ups and all the stuff. And people laugh about CrossFit, but it's like, what if that's the flow state activity for you? What if you really look at your, your goals right now and think, why do I even want the muscle? To be honest, like, yeah, by validation and stuff, and it might be nice. Like maybe the flow state activity for you in terms of exercise would be like jujitsu and you'll genuinely have a better life experience if you pursue the things that put you in flow rather than the things that you think will just get you the material success that we know won't change your life. Step two, how to get into a flow state. A year ago, I'm in my parents' house, in my bedroom, with a camera, about to record a video that the whole internet's gonna see. I'm recording YouTube videos for my channel, and I'm used to recording one video every day or every two days but I've learned of the, these new productivity tactics and I'm gonna use it on this day. I record one video. It felt like nothing because I've got no thoughts in my mind. I record the second video, the third video, the fourth video, the fifth video, the sixth video, the seventh video. I'm taken aback when I'm transferring the files over. I have recorded seven videos and it's still the morning time. That's when it hits me of how powerful getting into a flow state can be. But on this day, as I'm transferring over these seven video files that I've recorded before like noon, I'm realizing like I have just achieved what I thought was an exaggeration. I have done a week's worth of work whilst it's still the morning time. Programmers and software guys know this. There's a phrase called 10X programmer and a very rich investor named Naval Ravikant. He said once, forget 10x programmers, 1000x programmers exist. And he mentioned a few, there's Notch, the guy who made Minecraft, there's um, Sati Satitoso Mokoso, you know, the guy who made Bitcoin. These are seen as 1000x programmers. What that phrase means is they are 1000 times better than the average programmer like Coder. Getting into a flow state will genuinely not just make you one or two times better, it'll make you more like 10 to 100 times better than your competition. And you know what's interesting? If you're 10 times better than the competition, you don't get 10 times the results. You get more like 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 times more results. So if you are externally motivated, focusing internally is the way to do it because who's the fastest man alive? What's his name? You know him, right? Usain Bolt. Who's the second fastest man alive? Nobody fucking knows. Nobody knows. All glory goes to number one. The second guy who was 0.01 seconds slower 
you can visualize like some 100 meter sprint. You can almost visualize them, right? The winner's there. He's just won. He's got the tape around him and he's, you know, he's just run through it. The other guy is literally right behind him, genuinely like just the smallest be amount behind him. Nobody knows he exists. Nobody knows number two's name. Usain Bolt gets genuinely a thousand to 10,000 to a hundred thousand times more material success than the guy behind him. The flow state is your competitive advantage. And by the way, flow state, focus, productivity, mindset, business models, all of these things we teach inside of my online community. It's called Adonis School. It's the top link in the description. You can go there right now to see. It's the only product that I sell and I think it's really good. So you can just go check that out if you want. Step 2.1, minimize flow blockers. Flow blockers are things that will stop you from being able to get into a flow state. And I believe that the worst one is simply just thoughts and memories. I want you to understand how to focus. You might think that focus Focusing is when you have zero thoughts in your mind and that if you get a thought, it's a bad thing. Not exactly. So when you want to get into a flow state, you will notice thoughts and memories and everything starts to appear in your mind. That's okay. As soon as you hear those thoughts, simply just refocus back onto the thing that you were doing. Another flow blocker can be other people. You could be trying to study or to work and then your parents interrupt you. And I always say with this, We've got to be a little bit empathetic. It's like, you know, we live in the house with other people that they have their own needs. And sometimes it's hard for us to convey that we might need like this empty space and quiet for us to be able to pursue our goals. If you're finding your focus being disturbed by other people, family, friends, whatever it is, effectively communicate and just tell them like for this period of time for you know the next one or two hours i'd like to just focus as much as possible so please just try like if you do, you know to not need me for this time before i sit down to record any video like this i go around every room of my house and i go tell every family member i'm about to go record for like two hours just because they like it helps them know because there's been a bunch of times i've just grabbed my camera started recording and before i know it my dad's like hammering something in, in the wall or something my mom's cooking and she's being loud with the pots and i almost get pissed off like it's normal to you know to think like oh come on i'm trying to do some work and everyone's making noise but let's be honest like did you tell them how about just try and do that a lot of like young guys i've spoke to have really like bad like attitudes and values towards family and they seem to like get a little bit angry but it's like, okay let's take a deep breath let's just tell them next time you want to go into a flow state and i'll explain you know all the steps soon what if you just go do like the rounds around your house, every door, you know, you open it, your family's there, tell them, okay, I'm just going to go focus on something really, really important for about two hours. So please try to, you know, just keep it down. And let, then let's see, because unless you've ever done that, I don't think you have the right to complain that your family disturb you if you've never even asked them like not to in an effective way. If you've been like a little, you know, like a little child and you've been shouting at them and getting annoyed and being moody, that's probably not like the masculine virtuous, respectful way to go about it. You might have another flow blocker, which is task switching. You've heard so much online about like multitasking is really bad for you. This is what so many students and young people have problems with. There's a task that you're trying to do, like this big task, right? Let's say you're an affiliate marketer, like this business model, and you're editing a bunch of clips to, you know, you're going to be posting this content, right? You're editing these clips, but it feels quite daunting. It's quite hard. It's quite like strenuous. And before you know it, you click on Discord. Before you know it, you're thinking, oh, you know what? Oh yeah, I should I should go change my um, TikTok bio to this other thing. And you keep switching tasks like this and you know, you, oh, you remember the email that you had to reply to? Oh, I'm just gonna go check this other thing. What's actually happening is that you're building up to achieving flow. And because it just feels kind of hard right now, you just reset the progress instead of just sticking with it being hard. Now getting into flow is supposed to be hard, but too many people will feel that strenuous feeling and then just go jump to like a different task. So this is what I do, which you can copy. When I'm about to get into like, you know, a flow state to go here is the task that I really wanna focus on. I already know that I'm not going to like do any other task during this time. I'm not gonna stop this recording to quickly go reply to an email, that would be absurd, right? But it's the same thing when you have a task like studying and then you stop studying to reply to someone or you stop studying to quickly go do something else to make go make a cup of coffee halfway through or to go like, you know, check some emails quickly and reply to this message and everything. And the two flow blockers that I find most interesting, diet and sleep. These are the two biggest killers to your productivity. Most people don't talk about it. You know, the single greatest productivity tactic out there is intermittent fasting. 
buy it hands down no matter what productivity tactic guru whatever intermittent fasting is the single greatest tactic you could ever find no one can challenge me on that 100% fact your diet plays a huge part if you're eating carbs I'll destroy you. But for most people, when they eat carbs or junk food or sugar, it makes you feel quite weak, lethargic, brain fog. Most people don't even know how well they could work, you know. You might remember those times when, you know, you've woken up a bit earlier to do some work in some day, to study or whatever, and your brain was quite sharp on those moments. It wasn't because you woke up early. It was because you hadn't ate any of your meals yet. You genuinely don't know how good your brain can be. You don't know. If you go and experiment with this just for 24 hours, don't eat any carbs. You can eat meat, you can eat nuts, you can eat um, eggs and butter and stuff, fine. Keto's fine, carnivore's even better. You'll be so surprised that your brain is genuinely like two times as good as it usually is. And sleep is the same thing. The amount of students who literally will sacrifice their sleep to study more, you can destroy them. Literally, they're your competition. Like they, they, they'll go to bed late to just study more, which is like the complete like idiotic mindset. And you might be one of these students, right? Poor sleep is of course a flow blocker. And the final one is technology. Technology, notifications, distractions with your phone and your computer is probably one of the worst flow blockers out there. Let me tell you what my technology looks like. Everything is on airplane mode unless I'm currently using it. And when I'm done using it, I put it back on airplane mode. That's not an exaggeration. My laptop, Wi-Fi is off, Bluetooth is off, everything. My phone, airplane mode. If I need to use my phone for something, I'll personally turn off airplane mode, use it for what I need, put airplane mode back on. My phone is always on silent, do not disturb, and I've disabled all the notifications. So I don't see anything on the screen. And I've disabled what's called rise to wake, which means that like when you pick your phone up, most people's screen just turns on. My screen only turns on if I press the power button. So it's like, it's very like focused. This seems really extreme. I don't think so. It takes two minutes to set up and suddenly I'm literally like 50% more productive. That's my benefit. If you find yourself getting distracted quite a lot. So for example, I find that most YouTube videos out there are absolutely useless including like self-improvement videos, finance, all this stuff. I find that most YouTubers make like garbage, unhelpful, but entertaining videos, even if they're making it on productive topics. So I don't really watch YouTube like at all anymore, but I still need to go onto YouTube for my own work. So I have a list of YouTube extensions that I use, which means that when I go onto YouTube, I can't see any thumbnails, titles, views, videos. I can't see anything other than the thing I'm on there to work for, just so my mind doesn't get distracted. I turn those extensions off just that I record a video of the YouTube homepage recently. And the, I couldn't believe like the amount of thumbnails that I would see. You know, I hadn't seen like YouTube home screen for so long. My home screen is literally just white. You can't see anything. And I just saw suddenly like the normal amount of thumbnails, views. And I'm just thinking, bro, it's fucking garbage. I don't know how a fucking young person uses the internet these days because of how much it pulls your attention. It made me step back. But it just, it was very ucky. So I like, I disabled it all again. I don't want to see that shit. There's a video on my channel that you can go and watch. It's called, this will literally change your life in 12 minutes. And it's where I walk through every YouTube extension that I have. They're all for free. I've saved at least 25 hours, 50 hours since I downloaded them like a month ago. So I highly recommend you go and do that. That's your actionable step for this part. Go onto your phone, turn the notifications off. It's okay. You can go onto the settings, choose each app, especially the apps that you get a lot of notifications on your Instagram and everything. I find it weird that, that people will want to live a life where their attention is just sapped away, that your phone just like makes the fucking like fucking noise or some shit when you're trying to focus. Like how, how can you respect yourself if you're literally just set, like repeatedly saying, yep, I don't care about my attention or my fulfillment or my flow state. Please disturb me with the smaller shittest notification. Go on there and disable all of them right now. I'm just going to be a little bit honest. I want to fucking slap you if you don't do this. I want to shake you by the fucking shoulders and say, Please, like, love yourself. Your attention is worth more than these fucking stupid and, anno like, annoying notifications. Put your phone on black and white. It's like, close the, the email, the, the browsers, delete the, like, just stop using the shit that's, that's stripping your life away from you. I can't believe there's so many young people literally just have this amount of distractions. And it'd be easy for me to rally you up and say, you know what? This is the problem with the modern world. It's all distraction. No, fuck you, because I'm able to overcome this. So why don't you? I disable the notifications and life is absolutely fine. My phone's been on do not disturb for, for years. So why can't you just do it? You can set it all up today, right here, right now, as I'm saying these words, do not disturb, silent mode, disable notifications, put your phone on grayscale, 
Check your PC as well, turn all that shit off. This one actionable task through your life would save you over a decade. And you know what's interesting? More than 50% of the people watching this won't do it. There's 50% action takers, Adonis, 50% Jeffries, shallow breathers, and the 50% shallow breathers are still watching this video right now. So if you're still watching this and you haven't just taken action on the step that I've just been ranting about, we know which group you're in. So this is your last chance before we move on Take action on this immediately. At least go do one thing right now. Go get the YouTube extensions. Go put your phone on silent mode. Do not disturb airplane. Your focus, your flow state, your presence, your time is so important. Don't let it be taken away from you with th these addictive modern technologies. Step three, preparing for flow. In this new modern world, we no longer work like marathon runners, trying to put in the eight or 10 hour days. Instead, if you're a knowledge worker, if you're someone who makes money because of his brain, we work more like lions in quick sprints and then recovery afterwards. We need to prepare for work just like we would warm up before a massive workout in the gym. The setup, the preparation for the flow state work is incredibly high ROI. Because think of the two extreme guys and how they work. Let's say Jeffrey has no preparation whatsoever. He doesn't even study flow state. He wakes up, he knows he should do the very important task today, like studying. And he keeps pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. Yeah, yeah, I'll study today. I'll study today. Oh yeah, I'll go at 5 p.m. Okay, I'll go at, you know, I'll, I'll go at 6 p.m. 7 p.m. Yeah, I'll do it at 9 p.m. You know, I'll do a little bit there. If he does ever sit down to do any work, he's going to be so unprepared. He's going to like feel brain fog. His diet's been poor. He's going to look through the work and it's going to feel too hard for him to make any progress. Whereas Adonis is going to prepare beforehand. Adonis is just like the best students out there who minimize the flow blockers to begin with. He already has a good diet. He already sleeps well. He's already got his notifications on his phone disabled. His phone's on silent. Then he starts to prepare for his work bout, following like a step-by-step -step protocol that kind of gets him into a ritual to begin work. You've probably heard of like athletes who do this. All of these top level athletes usually have like a specific ritual that they do. I heard that from Michael Phelps, the, the famous swimmer. It's it's like, you know, he listens to the same eight minute song. He does the same exact stretch. Then he goes up and he stands this way. And, you know, he goes left foot first, right foot. They've all got a ritual so that they can be as deep into flow as possible. And then there's Jeffrey trying to imitate Michael Phelps. And he's got like clicky knees and his feet are all flat and all fucked up. And here he is thinking about what he's going to eat after this. Which one are you, Jeffrey or Adonis? So this is exactly what you do to prepare for the flow state work bout. You might wanna write this down. Number one, you have to clarify exactly what task it is that you're going to do. Too many students especially have a problem with this. They'll just say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll study tomorrow. It's not good enough. We need to know the specific task. So it's not just studying, it's like revising for question three. It's practicing the exam papers for this module. It's something very specific that makes it clear. For example, for a YouTuber, it's like record the flow state video. Imagine if I just said like, yeah, I'll work tomorrow at 9 a.m. That would be me being like an asshole to my future self because if that's me saying like, yeah, yeah, future self, you figure it out. I'm not gonna plan for you. You figure it out tomorrow when you are ready to work. You need to go spend a few minutes to figure out what the task will be. I'm not gonna plan it for you. Whereas if I have respect for myself, I'll sit here thinking, okay, what task should I prepare my future me to do tomorrow? I'll record this exact video. I'll script this exact video. I'll get into a meeting with this exact person. And you wanna know a secret? Most people don't even do this. Most people, it's like so vague for them what they're gonna do tomorrow. And so when they do wake up, they're just trying to figure out what to do. And the time, you know, the hours start passing by before they know it, it's 11 a.m., it's 12, it's 1 p.m. They're thinking, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll study, I'll go to the gym and stuff. And before they know it, they've missed another day of their schedule. The best students, the best workers, the best athletes, they know exactly which workout they're gonna hit tomorrow. Another thing that you can do to prepare for this flow state is to have everything digitally ready. 
So when I'm closing down at nighttime for you know my work, I shut down at 8 p.m. What I do is, first of all, I go and plan my day tomorrow. And I've got my calendar, okay? At 5 a.m. I'm gonna do this, 6 a.m. I'm gonna do this task. And then I open up like the exact page that I need. So if, for example, tomorrow I'm gonna go finish the script for this willpower video I'm making. I'll have that fully open, full screen on my computer, just kind of ready. I'll pull my computer to sleep, I'll go to sleep afterwards. But this way, when I wake up, it's like it's literally just there, digitally ready. So you're planning to study tomorrow at like 6 a.m. You can open up like the exact page that you'd need just so when it's time to work, it's already in front of you. The highest level athletes pay other people to set this up. For example, like the best bodybuilders and, and power lifters in the world, a lot of them have coaches that their coaches will be putting on like the weight plates for them. So imagine the difference between the power lifter who comes into the gym and the weight that he's gonna have on the bar like to begin with and all the ones going up, someone else has put it on for him so he can focus in just on executing. That's kind of like what we're doing for ourselves. We're loading the weight on for our future self so that he can just focus on executing. You can also have the physical space set up around you. With water, for example, have like water bottles where you don't even have the lid on them so it's ready to drink to stay in the flow state that we're about to get into. You don't even wanna have something that's like, you know, going downstairs to get some water or looking around for where the water bottle is and, and taking the cap off. I keep mine like this so it doesn't even have the lid on. I keep it in the exact same place so I can almost grab it like a robot and not even like look at it whilst I'm, you know, still scripting like that. If you've been taking notes on everything we've just spoke about, you know, we're gonna be setting up the um, the room, our water bottles ready, the mental perception of the task we're gonna do, the, at what time, Time and everything's set up right. Now this is gonna make you feel really good. Just take a second to think about how much extra intention we've just put in to just preparing to do work tomorrow. The average student or worker does absolutely no preparation beforehand and then doesn't get much done because the, the friction to doing the work is just so high because they haven't prepared. They start doing some work and they need some water so they go downstairs and here we are like setting a new level of standard for ourselves. So if you wrote notes on this section, just glimpse at it and just think to yourself, this is what's gonna make you stand apart from everyone else. Here's your actionable step for this part of the video. Have a step-by-step -step checklist or sort of bullet points of what your work preparation could be. So it could be like five things you're gonna check off before you even go and work. So for example, it could be a cold shower. It could be meditation. It could be having water ready. It could be even having like coffee ready. At this point, if you've made coffee, down it all. It's be way better than like, you know, sipping it nicely because it tastes nice over time. Down it all so you get the caffeine effect. Step 3.1 starting the work. Start the task with the intention of staying focused and you know, we wanna get into a flow state. Immediately your monkey brain will start to think of thoughts or memories or anything just irrelevant. And it's so, so important that as soon as you become aware of that, you don't get upset at yourself. You just refocus back on the task that you're doing. Doing this feels painful. This feels like a trudge. This is like the first stage of getting into a flow cycle. It almost feels like you're trudging through snow. It's like heavy snow up to your waist and it's very slow and you're taking one step and you're kind of falling and your mind keeps going off. It feels physically kind of agitating to be here. It's quite hard. You want to go click off. You've got 10 ideas of other things you could go and do right now. As long as you keep trudging, keep fighting, you will get into a flow state. It's the repetition of becoming aware that your mind has wandered and then just simply bringing it back to the task that you're doing. Once you've repeated that process about 50 times, that's when you click into a flow state. At this point, what I like to do is almost have like a mean gaze in my eyes. So let's say right now I'm trying to script a video, but my mind keeps wandering when I want to get into a flow state. I'll almost like squint my eyes a little bit and look at the exact letter, not even the word, but the letter that I'm currently typing and keep my eyes super, super focused. Not even like, you know, slightly looking around the room and chilling and stuff. And you know, I'll be doing this, then I'll think about high school or something irrelevant and I'll bring it back. Okay, come on, that letter that I'm currently typing and this really helps to get more focused. You're five minutes in, you're struggling, 10 minutes in, you're trudging through this thick snow and you keep thinking, you know what? There's other tasks I could be doing right now. There's something which isn't as productive, but it's a lot easier. I'm kind of motivated for that. Maybe I should change my entire routine actually. You know, this that other thing is a really good idea. Keep fighting. Step 3.2 breaking into flow. If you keep on fighting that monkey brain and you keep refocusing on the task, there's gonna be a point that you're not even super aware of where you'll just have no thoughts in your mind and you're just integrated in the task, literally flying through like with speed, with really high levels of performance. You're in a flow state. But it doesn't feel very magical or intense. It just kind of feels like there's just no thought in your mind and you're just doing pretty well at the task. And that's really all there is to it. It's not gonna be like this limitless pill, like, you know, this weird thing with the, the walls, you know, oh, like music's gonna start playing or anything like that. It's literally just like how you were before. 
but there's just no thought in your brain. And you just kind of like integrate it into the task really well. You'll be making more progress in every minute here than you usually would in every 10. So enjoy this time period and just keep focused on the task. Every now and then you might get a little bit of like a mind wandering. You might get a memory, a little thought. It can happen. When that happens, don't indulge in it. So let's say, okay, I'm scripting this video right now. I'm super, super focused. I'm in a flow state. And one random thought does pop into my mind. The weak like part of me might want to indulge in that thought and think about it and fantasize about it. But the strong part of me will hear the thought and kind of like squint my eyes again and super focused, you know, tell myself, no, 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 come on, focus, focus, boom. At this stage, just rinse out the flow state for as much as you can. Step 3.3, coming down. At some point between 60, and 120 minutes into this work bout, you'll start to notice that you're quite slumped over. You'll start to get monkey mind thoughts over and over again. And that just symbolizes the end of this current bout of work. You shouldn't be upset at this. Oftentimes when I first became aware of the flow state and my thoughts would like start coming back and I start getting distracted, I was quite upset and annoyed that I was, that I had like left this zone. But I realize now like you can't keep that going like forever, at least not as a beginner. There is a lot of spiritual teachers who say you can keep that going 100%. So we'll discuss that at the end of this guide. But for beginners who are quite new to this, you know, real world, non-spiritual people, it's like you can't expect it to last for like that long. So 45 minutes, one hour, one and a half hours is all good. When you notice yourself getting a little bit slumped over, your posture's not as good, your thoughts start wandering, you kept on looking at the time for the last few minutes, you're pretty much like coming down from the height of the flow and it's time to just kind of wrap up. So maybe you finish the current sentence or question. You should feel awesome about this and you can even say it like to yourself, like, yeah, well done. I've just completed a flow bout and actually did quite a lot. I got quite a lot done. The important thing is that you've shown up, you've had this intention, you've had an improvement today and you're committed to doing this over the long run. So what exactly do you do now once you're kind of coming down from that flow high? What I would say is, okay, save your work, you know, wrap up anything that you need to wrap up and then allow your brain to rest. The worst thing that everyone seems to do at this time, as soon as the flow state is like coming down, what do you think like the average person does? <laughs> Mouth breathing, phone, scrolling. <sighs> Don't do that. We have respect for ourselves. Don't just go on your phone straight away, even though you think, you know, it, it's not going to harm you. Imagine we've just done a brilliant workout. What should we do after that? We should rest. We should take it easy. We should do something that feels completely different. And yet most people will do this mental workout and then straight away over train by like checking their phone notifications, message, 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 this person, okay, YouTube video, everything. Allow your brain some time to rest. Maybe the single greatest thing you could do is go for a nap, literally just close you know, your blinds, wear the sleep mask if you have one, close your eyes for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, get up and then get ready for the next flow state again. And like, you could just grind that out if you wanted. If you plan to do another bout of flow state work sometime in the day, maybe soon after this current one, then I would really suggest not even looking at your phone at all. I'd keep yourself in this very like pristine, clean and pure mindset where you've sat down and you beasted out this one task, which is awesome. You take a break, go for a quick nap. You're not like trying to fall asleep, but you know, you've closed your eyes and you literally just wake back up again and you go sit down again and you're ready to like go again. You know, you've prepared for this. Okay, come on, let's go. Water bottles ready and you go for the second bout. Here's your actionable step for this part of the guide. Set up your routine for when you're gonna be doing these flow state bouts of work. Preferably you do them very consistently at the same time every single day. So for example, you have a 90 minute block or a two hour block of work at the same time every day. I personally like to wake up super early. I'm talking 4.30 a.m. And I have like my work block for the next like six hours, seven hours, eight hours. I'm not in a flow state for all of that, but it's rather okay. I'm in work mode. I'm sat here in my room on my desk. I'm ready. And in between that big block, I'll have multiple like bouts of flow state work as I'm doing right now. So figure out what could work for you. Is there a consistent task that you could do maybe every single day that would be quite demanding and it would require a flow state? Can you do that at the same time every single day? What you want to accomplish during that time? In my recent discipline full guide, I talked about the concept of waking up early and eating the frog. But the frog is kind of like the hardest task that you could possibly have. For me, it's recording videos. For you, it might be practicing the exam questions. If you can have that super consistent and you can do it every single day, you will move so far ahead all of the other people who just cope and waste time doing like those small but kind of pointless tasks. By the way, I've put in a lot of work into this full guide that you're watching right now. I'm recording for hours straight. My throat hurts. If you'd like to kind of thank me for that, please just scroll down, click on the like button right now, click on the subscribe button, spam the comments a little bit so the YouTube algorithm likes me. You can take like a two minute break reading some of the comments, getting some dopamine, and then come back up and make this video full screen again. Step 3.4, 
get into flow more often. There's a bunch of like easy hacks and ideas that we can use so that we're more likely to get into a flow state. And the first one is just coffee. Just having a cup of black coffee, non-estrogenic milk or anything like that, literally just black coffee with preferably filtered water. If you can, if you've got a filter at home, I do like a reverse osmosis filter. If you don't have one right now, that's something that you can choose to like save up and invest for. Cause let me just get on a quick side tangent. Your tap water is actually poisoning you and it's destroying your testosterone and making you infertile. People don't talk about this because it seems kind of crazy, but it's absolutely true. You need to get a reverse osmosis water filter ASAP. If you can't afford one, save up for it. It should be one of your priorities in life i'm not even joking people really fucking drink tap water bro it's literally got fucking hormone like it's got um birth control hormones in it's crazy my estrogen has went down by about 50 percent since i got one so coffee or caffeine pills can work really well i used to drink coffee kind of in a fun way where as i was doing the the task i was trying to focus in i kind of you know take a sip here and there i've realized now like the point of this is specifically not just coffee it's the caffeine in it so what i do is i like pretty much down the entire cup of coffee before i begin working so that, that way the caffeine is inside of me when you've got caffeine inside of you you're pretty much just going to be more alert focused and therefore more likely to get into a flow state another thing is having the right level of challenge to get into a flow state the task that you're doing needs to be at the right level of a challenge for your current skills so this is very similar to progressive overload if we take you into the gym and you're used to doing 80 kg bench press today we could challenge you and say okay try and hit 82.5 kg and if we hype you up for it, because that's still like, you know, all gym goers know this, even though that's only 2.5 kg, it can be kind of hard to hit that as like a new PR for the day, right? But let's say we hype you up for it and you get into a flow state because you're thinking, okay, 82.5 kg, that's what I'm going to hit today. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to try my best to hit that, right? Then you might do. But if, for example, we took you into the gym today, your usual bench press weight is 80 kg. And I said, oh, nah, do 100 kg, bro, and do it for reps as well. The challenges went so high relative to your skill. You know exactly what would happen if I, if I force you to do 100 kg bench press you'd start overthinking you'd lose the flow of the workout you'd lose your focus because you'd be thinking oh no i can't no it's gonna mess up my routine no you know i had the plan for doing this i was gonna increase it by 2.5 suddenly before you know it you're just completely distracted so don't be like the beginner who comes in and tries to increase the weight that he uses in the gym by too much be the smart guy who just increases it very very slightly over a long time. It's really easy to understand when we're talking about the weight that you lift in the gym because it's all numerical. When it comes to like actually the tasks that you do, it's kind of hard because how do you keep that to the right level? For example, how do I as a YouTuber make sure that recording a video like this is at the right level for me? Do you just like keep recording longer and longer and longer videos? You know, my videos are quite long right now, but I'm not doing that for the purpose of like flow state. It's just because I think that these longer videos serve more education. The way that I make sure that the challenge is always up to my skill level is I keep the challenge exactly the same, but I keep leveling up my skills through, for example, reading books and implementing them and getting advice and, you know, setting intentions to like level up one little bit. So maybe I'll look at like the camera more often tomorrow. Maybe I'll read a book on storytelling and I'll try and tell a better story. You keep the challenge the same whilst your skills go up to the point that it feels kind of boring to like do the task because it just feels kind of easy. So when, for example, recording feels like something that I don't even have to think much of, it feels kind of boring and, and you know, plain and mundane. That usually means that I need to increase the challenge. So maybe I stay vigilant and speak in a way that would be more concise so that the video performs better like I'm doing in this video. That's the challenge that I've set myself. You don't want to overwhelm yourself, but at the same time, you don't want to stay underneath your capabilities. You can also make your tasks more like a game. So a very simple game you could have if you're an author and you're writing a book on like Google Doc or something. Just look at the word count and see that as your score. So your word count right now is like 1,500 words and it's almost like a score to think, okay, I'm going to get to 2,500 of my score, like the high score today. Oh, I wrote 1,000 1,500 words, that's like 1,500 points in this game. It, it's like a high score for me. And this makes you more likely to get into a flow state because it kind of triggers like the, the deep intrinsic motivation and, and enjoyment in the task. You can even use something as specific as your vision to help you focus and get into more flow states. I've mentioned a few times in this full guide that when I really want to focus, I'll almost squint my eyes like this in a bit of like an angry way. The reason why is because I've watched a Andrew Huberman podcast where he talks about literally like narrowing your eyes, not blinking and like staring at a very specific small dot that you're like, you know, it's a part of your task. So for me, I'm looking into like right into the camera lens, like right there. When you're scripting or you're writing something, you might look at like the most like latest 
uh, sentence that's being put onto the screen. When you're studying, you might look at like each word that you're currently reading. If you narrow in your vision, usually it narrows in your thoughts as well. Likewise, if you've hiked up mountains recently, you'll know this. If you go to a place where your vision broadens out, so for example, you're on a mountain and you can see for like miles away from you, usually your thinking starts to broaden out and you start to have these very deep, big, high level thoughts and desires. So for this actionable step, choose one small part of this video that you can see of mine that you're just gonna stare at with like a squinted eye for the next like five to 20 seconds. Maybe like the tip of my mustache here, maybe my uh, my left eyeball here. Stare like with a squint of your eye and you're gonna force yourself to focus more than usual. Step four, flow state in workouts. The majority of people work out in such a pathetic way. They go to the gym, they're trying to get into the zone, they're trying to perform well, and yet they keep checking their phone, they keep changing over to the next track of degenerate music, to the next song, to the next song. Here they are messaging someone on the rest break from weightlifting. Here they are talking to someone there. Absolutely no focus. You'll notice that the best athletes don't train like this. The best athletes seem very focused for all of their practice sessions. And this is like the mindset we need to have when we go to the gym, when we go train in a workout, we need to see it as like this practice session that we're trying to get continuously better. The overwhelming majority of guys who go to the gym, you know, doing some weightlifting, they make all their muscle in like one year and then stop making gains after that because they stop challenging themselves. The challenge stays there but their skill goes slightly above it and that's why workouts just get more boring. Workouts, especially the ones where you're trying to build muscle and strength, they should be incredibly hard and strenuous. When you remember the first workouts that we did, the ones that really built a lot of muscle, how, how hard it was, you know, you couldn't even open like your arm the whole way because you were so sore the day after of training biceps for the first time. It shouldn't be so different from when you become more of like an advanced athlete. It should be super difficult. You can show up to the gym and you can even physically train hard, but if you're not mentally in a flow state, you will not perform your best. You will not hit many PRs. You will not actually keep making gains. Most people's gains just kind of plateau after a while. It's because they don't train their mental state. Because mind wandering, you know, just thinking about something irrelevant, remembering the thoughts and memories, checking your phone and being distracted like that, that will 100% lower your performance in the gym. And if your performance is lower, then your results will be lower as well. And this is 10 times more apparent when you do more of the hit CrossFit style workouts which like for example I could do you know like 10 reps of this exercise like I'm doing a kettlebell swing right then you put it down I'm sweaty I'm panting I'm tired I could hit it again right here right now I could hit it again but I won't because I'm just pussying out. The normal weightlifting sessions kind of save you from this because you have like a dedicated rest block. You know, it's like two minute rest break between sets of bench press. And if you rest longer, it's kind of better because you're, you know, your, your muscles more recovered and that's what the goal is to have recovered muscles. Let's hit a really good set again. When you do more of these brutal Spartan training, hit kettlebells, CrossFit stuff, it's like the point isn't to just try to make as much muscle as possible. The point is to have like a hard workout. And so you put the weight down but you could hit another five reps if you weren't being a pussy. You're there having a rest break, knowing, okay, I could hit a few reps right now, but I'm literally choosing to be a coward. I think that these are the workouts that really challenge you mentally. So you really want to get in a flow state, or as most athletes call it, in the zone for these workouts, because you'll have literally the grueling, sweaty, heavy panting kind of workouts that, you know, leave you feeling super proud as you're leaving the gym, compared to those sort of dry, cold, mundane workouts where it's just like a Tuesday morning and you're just putting in the time for the gym choosing like the uh, gym shoes and the shorts that you're going to wear today. Step 4.1, choosing the right workout for you. I've mentioned in this video that I changed over my workout routine and this has meant a lot to me. I was a weightlifter for so long and now I literally only use like the CrossFit kettlebell style of workouts. I just do a bunch of like hard exercises and you know I'm sweating. The protocol is like you're doing a bunch of movements every minute. So it's like you've got a timer ready and every minute you're going to do like the same six movements for like one or two reps then you put the weight down and it's time to go again within like 25 seconds and so it gets kind of scary after a few rounds you can just research this online it's just kind of like crossfit style workout it's called emom there's metcon a lot of like the weightlifters won't understand this but in crossfit you're not just trying to like you know do three times eight reps it's like you're almost partaking in a fitness challenge so it's like okay we've got 15 minutes on the clock and here's like a list of exercises that we need to try and get through so it's got to be fast so if you're sat there wanting to take like two minute rest breaks you won't perform well the reason why i switched over here why i'd ask you to just be open to what I'm about to say. It's because I realized that before this, I was only sort of externally focused. I only wanted the reward of, you know, the muscle gain from the gym. So I'll ask you right now to just be honest to yourself. Are you almost entirely extrinsically motivated? 
Are you going to the gym or whatever kind of workout you do? Are you doing that just for the results? Or are you doing that because of the fact like today's workout makes you feel awesome? Because I think it's a shame to train for so long as I did without really like loving the workouts, but rather just loving the results because you can have both. When you see like pictures and videos of CrossFit guys, honestly, they're more jacked than most bodybuilders and weightlifters are. And likewise, maybe you're going to the gym right now, like weightlifting because you want to build muscle, but you don't really enjoy the workouts and you don't really get into much of a flow state in the workout, but you would get into a flow state in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But it doesn't have like, you know, you won't make muscle from doing jujitsu. So then it's like, do you trade the extrinsic result that you wanted just to get the flow state experience today? That's for you to decide. So it's worth you just spending a few minutes and asking yourself, what kind of workout would you get into a flow state for? And then just consider like just doing that one from now on. For me personally, martial arts of any kind was always extrinsically motivated. I'd always do martial arts, kickboxing, Muay Thai, MMA, BJJ. I did all of these because of this extra desire of like validation of, you know, people on YouTube would think that I was quite badass and everything. On every session that I did of those, literally my mind would always wander. It always felt quite boring and agitating and just kind of like annoying to be there. But it kind of, you know, made me feel good in some ways because of the fact that I knew I'd get validation for it. Finally, when I had enough confidence and self-respect, I just quit all of that stuff entirely because I realized if I'm like, I'm literally doing it for other people, that just seems sad now. Then I switched over like back to weightlifting and I realized weightlifting is kind of fun, but I can take this like one step further. And now I'm very happy with the workout routine that I have. Step 4.2, don't bring your phone to the gym. It's back about 15 years ago. I'm around 10 or 11 years old and me and my best friend from high school are in the back garden of my house and we're punching each other we've got these boxing gloves on we're practicing like boxing just for fun and he does something which is just super embarrassing it gets a little bit like tough you know i get a good hit on him or whatever happens and he almost like starts like whimpering and crying a bit and i'm like i'm sorry whatever okay it's but you know stop being a pussy he takes his gloves off he walks over to the bench out, like the garden bench out, outdoors he sits down and the first thing he does is he pulls his phone out of his pocket and starts scrolling on like facebook instantly it was so odd to see this like i instantly lost respect for him like forever because i was just it, imagine how odd that is that you're here you are sparring with someone he gets hurt and it's like his his natural reaction is to just pull his phone out and just start scrolling and just get distracted instead it kind of makes sense because maybe it was too intense for him or something and you know facebook gave him a sense of like comfort or pleasure or something but that isn't far from most people's experience in the gym they experience it being a little bit tough and out of nowhere they just choose to voluntarily distract themselves and to lose their flow state the best workout you'll ever have correct me if i'm wrong but the best workout you will ever have is when you go to the gym you don't touch your phone you leave the the music playing and you don't even keep changing the tracks or anything you've got your hood up and you're literally sweating and grunting and like you literally feel awesome most people don't work out like that most people will go and do like one set in the gym or two minutes and they'll just be like hopping back onto their phone I'll give a disclaimer that sometimes this can be okay if you're doing certain activities. So for example, sometimes I like going to the gym and doing like zone two cardio, literally just walking on the treadmill. And I'll use my phone for the entire time that I'm there because I'm literally just multitasking like sort of shallow work, which is absolutely fine. But if you're trying to have like an awesome workout, you're actually trying to like grind and do something big. To constantly keep stopping to check your phone is just, it's, it's sapping your potential. So when you're on a rest break at the gym, in my opinion, you should stare at the equipment or the weight like a psychopath. Let's say you've just hit a set of bench press. Straight after that, you know, you, you rack it. Everyone will check their phone and just fuck around, right? I would, if I was you, almost turn around or stand up and look at the bar like it's your fucking enemy and just stare at it like a weirdo because that, like, literally keep your eyes pinpointed on it, kind of like Huberman's advice, you know, of keeping your eyes, like, quite squinted, of focusing on a very small bit. It just makes you, like, feel so much more, like, I don't know, like, badass or hardcore. It puts you into, like, beast mode. It sounds cringe, but it's true. And that's so much better than just quickly, oh, yeah, let me go check if Hamza's posted on Instagram. Like, it's on the rest break that most people sacrifice the next set because they get distracted and if you sacrifice the next set then you've sacrificed your entire workout and if you've sacrificed your workout then you're sacrificing your health and your physique your fitness 
So people don't realize how man, much consequences there is to just being distracted on your phone a little bit. You can push a lot harder when you're super focused. No phone, no messages, no scrolling, no changing the music that's on right now. Just leave it playing. For a lot of guys, I would honestly suggest don't even bring your phone to the gym. If you've got the self-control to not use it, fair enough, you can bring it in. You might need to like use it for emergency or something. But I'd say for the majority of people, they don't have the self-control. They'll just automatically pull it out because of muscle memory. If you just put the phone somewhere else, put it in the locker, leave it at home and go to the gym. You will actually end up having such a better workout than usual. And truthfully, what I've realized is that you don't even need music for a good workout. For most of my workouts, I've always listened to music. It just seemed like the right thing to do. It seems almost weird to not work out with some like songs playing. Now I'm at the exact opposite end of that where I've realized that it might be better to work out in silence because that's when your own brain will start to say the kind of motivational thing. So you know how sometimes you're listening to a song and the rapper or singer says something kind of cool that makes you press a little bit harder. Why don't you just say that in your own brain? Why do we need some other guy who's like talking about his success and how great he is? How much testosterone he has compared to you and that he's sleeping with girls and essentially you're not. And here you are thinking like, yeah, yeah, me, me and this guy are so cool. Me and this rapper are so cool, bro. He's not talking about you. You seem like a chump. You're like, you're like a fucking de like a worshiper of this, of Drake, of all these like rappers. We're worshippers of these people. We literally worship them as gods listening to their message 24 seven. Think about how fucking weird this is. Rappers will literally rap about how great they are and about how many women they fucking impregnate. And we will be here brainwashing ourselves to their message thinking like, yeah, we're so, you know, this feels so good. You're not part of it, bro. You're the little fucking loser, like, like ingesting the message. That doesn't make you cool. That makes you like super uncool. And that's not even to mention all the problems of it being like degenerate music of it, like really starting to reframe your mind and your affirmations of, of the world. And you know, he's talking about being so cool that he, he robs people, that he's aggressive, that he's this type of person, that he sleeps with loads of women. And here we are listening to it and it starts to form these beliefs in our mind. You can't listen to someone inside of your fucking brain of someone speaking about being a degenerate and it's good every single day and then hope not to become a degenerate from that. When you really think about it like this, it's almost sad that like you're, we're here plugging in like, oh yeah, let me just listen to Drake's, you know, saying how good he is. Oh yeah, let me just listen to this degenerate rapper when, you know, he's talking about like killing people and how, like how, um, you know, how gangster he is. Is that not like a complete, honestly, like beta male activity? I still listen to music, but I don't listen to music that has any lyrics. I only listen to like weird, like war tribal music now. It's all just instr instrumentals or maybe there's some like chanting or something. And that feels kind of nice because I can still kind of talk mentally over it. But what you might want to try is just go with absolutely no music and the few things that you've heard in songs that have pumped you up, that suddenly you started pushing harder because, you know, the rapper talked about, you know, being this, like, this kind of man. You could say those things without the song playing anyway. And you'll probably say them even better. And if anything, you'd be training your, your own brain to say, like, words of strength. Come on, I can do it. Come on, I can push harder. I can and I will. Step 4.3. Warm up. Literally. You've always heard of the concept of warming up in the gym. Yeah, what's your warm up today? Yeah, you're just warming up. But people don't really explain like what exactly it is. It seems almost like this vague thing. And in the weightlifting space, warming up kind of means like, okay, doing the same exercise, but just with like lighter weight. I realize it's actually something different, but it's so obvious in common sense. Warming up literally means like, getting a higher body temperature. And I didn't know this. I thought warming up meant like, you know, doing some stretches or whatever, doing like some practice exercises. Warming up generally like means, okay, get a little bit sweaty. So for a better workout, and I guarantee you this, you will be more likely to get into a flow state if your body is like specifically just warmer. So what I highly recommend is that when you go for the workouts that mean a lot to you, wear a hoodie, wear some pants, even if it's like super, super warm outside, like wear some like thick clothing and you'll find that it's those workouts where you're drenched in sweat that you are having like the best workout in such a long time so just get warmer do like five to ten minutes of light cardio like walking on the treadmill or the stairmaster machine before you even touch any weights and just have a simple rule for your workouts make sure you're sweaty whether it's the summer or the winter, make sure you're sweaty. That's the point. If you're not sweating whilst you're having your workouts, you're there in your little shorts and a vest like this and the gym is air conditioned, guarantee you will not push anywhere near as hard as you could do. 
when you wear slightly thicker clothing, the hoodie, and you're actually pushing to the point that you're like your sweat's dripping out of your shirt into the hoodie as well, that's when you're going to be hitting some mad PRs. It's the moment when you first really break a sweat and you feel it on your forehead and your armpits. That's when you'll instantly enter a flow state in the gym. What's interesting, if you take your hoodie off then and you feel like that, that, that sort of cool breeze hit the sweat and you know, like when you're wet, it's like it feels kind of colder when uh, air hits you. That's when you'll actually notice that you'll start to lose your flow state. So I think it makes sense just stay sweaty through the workout. One extra tip for this is make sure you're wearing like 100% cotton clothing. Make sure it's not like polyester or anything that's estrogenic. I've got like a full guide on estrogenics where I mentioned the tap water being kind of like poison for us because it's got birth control hormone and everything. This is actually a very huge problem. So make sure you're not wearing like clothes that are made out of polyester. You know, like normal gym clothes, you shouldn't be wearing them as a man. Here's your actionable step for this part of the guide. Plan which clothes you're gonna wear for the next workout and make it just slightly warmer than what you usually wear. Wear the hoodie when you normally don't wear one. Wear like the, the thicker pants that you've got or the thicker shorts and just give it a try. Keep the hoodie on even though you feel kind of like a little bit too warm and maybe a little bit claustrophobic. And just wait till you burst into like a sweat and just see how it feels after that. Step five, flow states in relationships. Maybe you're used to your mind wandering when you're in the middle of conversations. Maybe that happens when you're having sex and you start to fantasize about a different woman. When that's happening to you, it's happening to her. When you're fantasizing about fucking a different woman whilst you're having sex with your partner, she's fantasizing about being fucked by a different guy. Not being in a flow state for your relationships is horrible. So we need to fix that. Because otherwise, all you're gonna have are these sad and stupid, shallow relationships, which are just pointless. If you're with someone who's constantly overthinking and they're not even present and they're not even conscious next to you, it's like they're not even there to begin with. If you're the one who's not present, if you're the one whose mind always wanders when you're next to people, there's no point in you even being there. There's no point in them inviting you to, for you to be there next time. People don't wanna be around others who they can tell aren't very present because it's a very ugly trait to have. Imagine me and you were speaking, you're telling me something important and you can see that my mind just drifts. You can physically see it. You instantly would lose respect for me. And even if you somewhat liked me, the truth is you wouldn't want to spend much more time with me. Now, relationships are one of the most important parts of our lives. And in fact, in the book that I read for this video, it's called Flow by Mikhail Chekmiksaya, like this, this guy who discovered the concept of flow states. He actually ended up finding that through his studies, work, and relationships were the times when we were most happy, but also most upset and depressed. The kind of like two big extremes. Work can make you super, super happy because you get into a flow state and you feel super happy with yourself, but it can make you super depressed because you could hate your work, you hate the commute and everything else attached to it. Relationships can make you super happy because it can be you in a flow state with people that you love. It can be this loving relationship that you have with this beautiful feminine woman and it could be your mother telling you stories, but it could also be this abusive boss. It could also be this dad who shouts at you. It could also be this girlfriend that you don't even like. So they're the two extremes. Now, if we can get to the top end of this extreme, then you can start to live this very unique, happy life. Step 5.1, why relationships get boring. This is exactly what happens, and you can clarify me if I'm wrong, but you meet this girl and things are super, super exciting. You actually get butterflies on the thought of like meeting her in person or calling for the first time you're shaking, right? That means that the challenge for this task is actually quite high. But with the girl that you end up attracting, usually that means that your skill was at the right level. So the challenge, the sort of difficulty of this situation was high, but your skill level was high. You meet her for another date, it's the same thing. Eventually you have sex and it feels like, you know, it's, it's really perfectly on level like this. Soon you've been in the relationship for three months, for six months, she's smelt your poop. 50 times. The challenge has dropped, but your skill level is still here. This is why relationships feel kind of boring because your skill's too good for it. This is kind of like playing level one on a video game, but just forever. Most couples are the equivalent of that. They're literally just playing like this beginner's game, even though they've got higher skills. So when the challenge and difficulty is very low, but your skill is higher, it results in boredom. You can imagine this, right? Imagine playing a video game that's too easy and then being forced to just play the same level over and over and over again. You'd get bored. You'd want to cheat. You'd want to go play a different video game. Now imagine if you made a pact with this original video game that you would only play that one and none more. You would cheat. Or you'd be tempted to every single day thinking, why the fuck is your, your relationship so boring when all those other games look so much more fun, right? 
So how do we fix this? How do we fix the big problem of relationships getting so boring? We need to just increase the challenge level, the difficulty level. This is our skills, this is the challenge, the difficulty. Naturally, when we spend time with someone, the challenge starts going down because we get used to them and our skill goes higher because you know we, we start learning more things about relationships and our ability to express ourselves and to partner up and everything, right? So we're here, we start feeling bored. This is where most couples will live for their entire lives. But the couples who know about flow state will be constantly thinking to themselves, how do we increase challenge and difficulty in our relationship? Step 5.2, conversations. Conversations are a place that we can increase the challenge and difficulty in the relationships. Here's our current conversational skill, our current skill in relationships. Here's where we are. This is where our conversations are. You know that I've seen some studies that show like very sad facts that the average couple, like 30 year old, middle-aged somewhat couples, they literally have like 40 minutes of quality conversation a week. Most of their conversation is just like logistics. It's all just like, oh yeah, what are you going to do today at 5 p.m.? Yeah, I'll go to this place. Then I'll come, you know, it's just boring stuff. They're not even like expanding their consciousness together. The couples who are on track to become like really loving and they understand flow state, what they'll do is they'll realize their skills really high. So they'll say, okay, well, how can we use our skill? Let's ask each other harder questions. Let's explore the depths of each other's minds because that's super, super interesting. So one person in the couple looks to the other one and says, what are you most afraid of? And the challenge goes up and that one answers and then they ask back, okay, so what are you most afraid of? That one goes up. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you as a child? Now you see like we're making the relationship, the conversations a little bit more difficult compared to the mundane, usual conversations that people get into. And suddenly we're at our skill level and you know, you can go too far. You can maybe ask a question that's like super triggering or, you know, personal or something. And you maybe aren't that close in the, like enough in the relationship to deal with that. And your skill is like, you know, below that, fair enough. But by asking these deep questions, these random things that you just wanna almost pick the brain, like explore the brain of your partner, it makes your experience with them more complex. Now I must point out, this is not simping. This is not bo like blue pill or something. In, in the modern space, it's so weird. You can be speaking about like a wholesome relationship activity and little kids will comment like, ah, oh, simp, how is this anything like simping at all? This is you with a partner that you have chosen, now leveling up the skill of love, which is mutually beneficial. That's awesome. So in these conversations, you can ask deeper questions and then follow the same principles that you know about flow states. Remember, so at first it might feel like a bit of a trudge. It, you know, it feels kind of like a bit slow, like you're in that waist deep level of snow. After you've asked your partner a deep question, your mind might start to wonder. You might get a little bit bored or agitated. You might want to change the topic, but you bring the attention back, just like we did with a task like that we're doing on our computers. We, do, we use the exact same flow principles in conversations. So you must know that you're mind is going to wander and that for the first five or 10 or 20 minutes of the conversation, we're just going to constantly keep bringing it back and, you know, maybe stare at one of their eyes or something to stay focused. Obviously using good listening skills will help here. Don't just start to like form your response to the question in your mind before they have finished talking. Let them talk. Try your best to absolutely like listen to every like tiny little pitch of their voice. Listen to their voice as if you're going to go deaf tomorrow for, for life every tonality, every way that they express themselves. See the sweetness in that? You know, you can pretend that you've just been deaf for the past 20 years and their voice is the first thing that you hear. Listen to it with that much detail. You wouldn't interrupt. You wouldn't be thinking about what you're gonna say next, would you? Now imagine if you do this enough that your partner starts to do this for you. Imagine if your partner listens to you so well that it seems like she literally is like preparing to go deaf and she just wants to hear your tones and, and um, speech patterns. Think about the level of relationship you can get to when you just increase the challenge just in the conversations. Your actionable step and do this right now is to write down three open-ended deep questions that you can ask anyone that you love. So maybe it's your girlfriend, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's your brother. Some kind of like deep question that would help you explore the depths of their mind. I know that I can just give you some ideas, but I'm not going to. I want you to really think about the person who you'd ask this question to and just ask yourself like authentically, what would I actually kind of like to know about them? What don't I know about them already? What's an experience of their life? 
that I would probably find like super interesting to know. Write those three questions down and set an intention right here, right now that you're going to ask one of these questions today, whether it's in like a video call or it's in person, you're going to ask one of them today to deepen your conversation. Step 5.3 enlightened sex. I won't make this section like PG-18 or anything, but it is something to consider. I've read a couple of books on spirituality and one of the practices that seems to be like of importance seems to be making love, not just like like basic sex that you've heard of, that you've seen on porn or you know that you might have had with your girlfriend already. You go from having normal sex to having sex where you focus on like merging together and kind of almost imagining that you're one person that you've combined as a whole. And the way that you start this, I can't tell you advanced tactics, but I can tell you the way to start, which is super interesting. And it is to unkink some blocks that we might have to be able to make love properly. From an early age, there's been blocks placed onto our sexuality, our physical body, our emotional state, our psychology. And these things have actually made it harder for us to like genuinely be in love with our partners. So this, what I'm talking about isn't like degeneracy. This is something that you'd want to practice with your wife, right? So that you'd really get like a strong tie to her. So even if you know you're not like a degenerate, even if you're like a strong convicted Muslim, you'd want to watch this because you'd want to be able to practice this when the time is there. But the saddening truth is, if you've watched porn for years, you've largely lost your ability to do this. The concept of being a teenager who's watching porn, what is it? It's shy, it's dark, it's away in your room, you're not making any noises. You often like, you feel kind of naughty and restricted and you feel quite shameful for because you're watching other people, you're watching something you shouldn't watch and that's a feeling of shame. And you start to associate these feelings with sexuality from a very early age. You start to like death grip your penis and so you lose like sensation in there. You shallowly breathe or in fact, you kind of hold your breath when you usually masturbate. We practiced this wrong way of like making love for 10 years for what, a thousand times, maybe more? Probably about 5,000 times we practiced. You know, they, they say like, oh, it takes 10,000 hours to master a skill. We mastered the skill of like, of, of masturbation, but masturbating in the sort of normal porn focused way starts to really deteriorate your ability to actually make love properly. So the first big tip that I can give you is to be able to breathe properly. What you'll find, if you're very new to this, you won't feel this like at all, right? So you won't feel anything significant, but let me just tell you of what you should do for, like for the rest of your life. You wanna focus on really breathing so deeply so that your breath goes from your nose all the way down as low as possible, like down the front of your body towards literally like your genitals. You wanna like see where you can feel it up to. So if you do this with me right now, like take a big, like sort of deep breath through your nose. Where do you feel it kind of stop? I felt it just below my belly button, not good enough. The kind of deep breaths we need to be taking should literally like genuinely move our balls. So if you, it's kind of weird, but if you want to do this, like if you just want to like look at your balls for a second. If you're, if you're being honest with yourself and not like twitching yourself on purpose, you probably won't see it. The way that you'll see, okay, I'm going to tell you what to do now. If you straighten out your back a little bit, sit up a little bit straighter. In fact, it's a lot easier if you stand up. Sitting seems to be really bad for this, which I always just think, isn't that like a weird coincidence? that we were made to like sit down in, in shitty chairs for like 80 years straight in, in school, but whatever. What you wanna do is take more of like a forceful breath and push the air into your balls. And it's just about the last part. If you can really breathe it in, it's the last part. And this is super hard because you're not gonna do this 24 seven. But the idea is we need to be taking much deeper breaths than we currently are. These shallow little half breaths where our stomach doesn't even rise are very problematic. This is very interesting, right? So the book that I use is like my guidebook to life, The Way of the Superior Man. There's a passage in there which says, the principal bodily key of mastering the world and women is to maintain a full and open front of the body and you do this by breathing fully. Think about that. The principal bodily key, like the, the main thing we can do with our body is to be able to like just be open in the front of our bodies and we do that with our breath. This is the most important thing that you could use your body for it, like in the world apparently. 
How interesting is that? Open up the front of your body. You think about all the shit that we've done, like the, this hunched over posture that's been closing our bodies down. Do the exact opposite. Sit up straight, chest out, shoulders back. Breathe, let, let the flow of breath go down deeper and deeper and deeper over time. Trust me when I say that this is a long process. I've been doing this for, I don't know, about a solid year is when I first learned like about this practice. And it's only in the last few months that it's really taken off because I've really like been focused on it a lot more, reminding myself. It's gonna take a lot of work, but I'm just gonna motivate you. When you learn to breathe properly, you can have sex for as long as you want. Like you don't need to, you don't need to bust. You can literally choose when you want to. So there's sometimes, not always, but there's sometimes I can last for as long as I want now, I'm like genuinely hours. This is like your God given right. And it's been taken away from us because of the shitty modern world. You must be able to breathe properly, especially when it comes to having sex and being like sexually stimulated. You'll find that when you are about to have sex, when you're about to enter like a sexual situation, you will absolutely start to hold your breath or to breathe shallowly. When that happens, you've almost got to like let your stomach relax and breathe more deeply into that. So all of this is so that when you do really want to level up your love with this woman that you're about to have sex with, You'll be able to like almost breathe love into every part of your body rather than being mentally sort of constrained with like fascination or, you know, like literally with this obsession of needing to ejaculate. Most guys literally will have sex in two ways. Either one, they'll be mentally fantasizing or two, they'll be obsessing over like the feeling of ejaculation. And this is like, that. this is like literally level zero sex. This is like literally as bad as your sex life could be. Porn stars and all this stuff, none of them know this. If you want to hear like good sex advice, you don't want to hear it from like real world people. You want to hear it from spiritual people. The book, The Way of the Superior Man, chapter 46, can help you there. And step six, The Way of the Superior Man. I've decided, okay, let's just make this into a section for this video. Because as I was studying flow state for this full guide, I realized just how much it overlapped with what I've learned about spirituality from the other book, The Way of the Superior Man. So I'm going to tell you about a few overlaps that I saw. I had read the book, The Way of the Superior Man, a long time ago, a year ago, and I've been constantly rereading it and it served me really well. And there's parts of like the spiritual talk in there, which I never really understood. There's loads of mentions in there that when you have sex with a woman, you can like sort of merge into one and you can almost like experience God through that act. And I always thought, that was like, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I started to research flow state. And one of the things that's mentioned in there is that when you get into a flow, you merge into one with the task that you're doing. So athletes say like, it almost feels to them like they've merged into the game themselves. Pianists, you know, the guys who are playing the piano, they feel like, okay, they're just a part of the piano now. So it made me realize that to get to this point of like feeling the spiritual love, like the next level of love that we barely even understand, you need to be in a flow state. And you've probably heard of the spiritual term ego death before. Ego death, ego dissolution. The idea is like ego is like our perception of ourselves. And a lot of spiritual teachers talk about this concept of like essentially killing or like letting your ego die so that you can merge into one. And it's the exact same thing. Like it seems to me that to experience ego death, which is apparently like one of the most important things that we need to be able to do like at some point, we need to be able to get into a flow state because the flow state is like the dissolution of yourself into the task that you're doing. And then there's another chapter in The Way of the Superior Man, which is the lean just beyond your edge. That's the exact same principles for flow. To get into a flow, you have to lean just beyond your edge. You have to slightly set the challenge a little bit higher than usual so that it stays on the level of your skill or even a little bit past it so that it's, it constantly requires more from you so that you're quite present and challenged. The Way of the Superior Man says that you can't have the challenge too high because otherwise Otherwise, it, you'll be off center, you'll be too tense and stressed, and you won't be able to really realize this experience that you're going through. But you also can't have the challenge too low, otherwise it's just boring and mundane. And that's the exact same principles for what we hear in flow state, which is that the challenge and the skill needs to be at the right level. If the challenge is too low, you're not gonna grow. If the challenge is too high, and you've got this sort of egotistical arrogance kind of mindset, like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna go run a marathon every single day, you know, David Goggins and everything thing then you end up like not even like if you do complete it which is unlikely you end up not actually learning the lesson you were supposed to this book again the way the superior man mentions that you do this out of the exact same reason why you keep the challenge too low 
It's all out of fear. Fear is what causes us to act in a way that isn't for our best interests. You fear being a loser, and so you set the challenge of like whatever you're trying to do too high. You fear you know, pushing yourself too hard and so the challenge is too low. I've spoke a lot about the concept of finding your purpose as a young masculine man, and that's what I've learned from the way of the superior mind. It seems to me that the way you can find your purpose is by feeling out a bunch of different tasks and finding which ones you naturally have quite a lot of like in intrinsic enjoyment for. So, you know, flow has all been about like the specific task that you're kind of intrinsically pulled towards that, you know, dissolves you of thoughts and it's you're not doing it for the external results. And so it seems to find your purpose. You just need to go and find like which tasks or jobs or, or, or responsibilities kind of put you into a flow state. And that might be a great way to find what you're actually supposed to do to like free your soul. I've got multiple guides on purpose on my channel. So you can just go search on YouTube, Hamza Purpose, if you want to learn more about that. From what I'm hearing about these books on like masculine spirituality, it seems to me that if you're not going to like live your life totally obsessed about your purpose, there's no point in living at all. And once you understand that, your jaw will drop and you'll realize that you've wasted decades of your life so if you're willing to go down that realization, just search Hamza Purpose on YouTube and you'll realize what I mean by that. Step seven, how to keep making more progress. You've experienced flow by now. You might be able to get into it fairly consistently, maybe most days, which is awesome. Don't just settle for getting into flow. Remember that to maintain this flow state, to maintain your growth in life as a man, you have to be constantly leaning just beyond your edge. This means that when you do experience flow state, enjoy it, capitalize on it, you know, do the work and everything, but keep setting these task intentions to make the, the state, the sort of block of work slightly better each time. You need to have this slight level of like challenge increase, just like the, the weightlifter goes to the gym and brings the little plates with him and you know, he increases it by 0 0.5 kilograms every single like week or every two weeks. That's what we need to have with our flow state. We can never just let our work, our life, our fitness and diet and everything like that just kind of maintain because that's where boredom comes from. You need to keep following like the flow state rules and not get very egotistical to think that you don't need this anymore. This is almost a, a message to my younger self because at least for me, I often get very obsessed with like a concept and I really, really go all in on it and it feels really super important, but then I get distracted because I'm watching like other YouTube videos and everything. And before like a week or two weeks, it's almost like I've forgotten the whole thing that I was so obsessed with to begin with. This seems like a really, really important, not just for the real world benefit of, you know, like doing more work, but for the discovery of like who you are as a person and all those spiritual benefits. So it seems to me that this is something that's worth prioritizing. This is something that's worth scheduling. This is something that's worth like sort of forming into your identity. I am a guy who regularly gets into a flow state that any task that you're doing, no matter what it is, you're brushing your teeth, you're eating, you're cooking, you're, you're working on like the business or you're in the gym. You're constantly reminding yourself of that concept of like, yeah, my mind is going to wander. All I need to do is just bring it back to this present moment and to also be pursuing things for the intrinsic motivation rather than the external results. Soon, I'm going to give you a warning, soon after watching this guide, whether in a few days, a week or two weeks, your mind will be totally hooked on a new desire, on this new external result. The modern world does this to us. So right now you feel kind of wholesome. Yeah, you know, flow state's so important. Soon you will be hooked onto this new desire of like, yeah, getting the car or the money or the finance or whatever it is. And you'll start to pursue tasks and activities which you're not even getting a flow state from just because you want the external results. You have to remind yourself, no external result is gonna change your experience of life. Your experience of life is purely just what you make of it mentally. There was naked men in concentration camps who were starving, who were happier than millionaires are today. You're, obviously, you, we don't want to trade positions with them, but your experience of life is all down to your own mental perception. It's all down to whether or not you can get into a flow state today, whether or not you feel like you're doing something important. Don't trade those wholesome spiritual things just because you see another influencer talking about his fancy car or his watch or, you know, this guy saying that you should live this lifestyle. If you can live authentically to yourself, then you can live a very good life. If you have got this far in this huge full guide and you really love to learn and you want to level up and become like an even better man of character and you want to start getting into like the way of the superior man and you want to start training like a Spartan and you want to think like a Stoic, Adonis School is literally the perfect place for you. That's the top link in the description. I really think you should go check it out. With the word 
work that I'm doing here, my hope is that we as a generation of young men can really get to the next level and become like these higher tier men of character. Not just, you know, men with real world success like everyone else seems to be talking about, but like I want to walk past a man who isn't just entirely focused on like muscles and money, but rather is focused on his character, his values, his virtues. I want to walk past men who are literally reading books on stoicism. I want to walk past a guy who's been practicing meditation because these are the, these are such important things that are so overlooked these days. That's why I do the work that I do and I hope that you've benefited from that. If there's just one thing that you could do, please spread positive word of mouth about this video. When it comes into conversation, when you think that someone might need to hear about flow states and focus, mention this video to them. Just tell them like, oh, you should go watch Hamza's focus video. You should go watch Hamza's focus guide. You should go watch Hamza's full guide on flow states. Just by you spreading positive word of mouth about this video, naturally more men in the world will actually learn this lesson. And that just means like the guy next to you is gonna be more focused when he speaks to you. Soon you're gonna have a business partner and he's actually present with you. Maybe a bunch of women will end up watching this video. 3% of my audience are women and the more women who find content like this, the more present and focused they can be when they're with us and we can actually start to form like the kind of life we should be living. You also need to watch my full guide on discipline. Go click that video right now. Do the hard work, especially when you don't feel like it. Mwah.